Good morning. <clears throat> I've selected a couple of passages this morning which were read uh, earlier because uh, they use a phrase that I want to bank off of this morning and that phrase is, is night watches and <clears throat> selected the reading from Psalm 63 and, and then from Leviticus uh, second chapter where in both instances the writer refers to the, the night watches and uh, <clears throat> I don't know somehow uh, phrase catches my attention just a little bit. You know, in, in the time when these scriptures were written, night watches was uh, a literal thing. It was something that um, uh, cities did and, and military uh, camps would do. Uh, to put guards up during the night at three-hour intervals to watch, to protect the camp or to protect the city. And thus, uh, the phrase night watches, uh, again, was a very serious thing. Now, for you, we don't do that. We're not worried about that. So night watches will take on a different meaning for each of us. It might be that night watches means that time when insomnia hits you and you wake up and you can't go back to sleep or you can't go to sleep to begin with or you wake up at some strange hour and try as you will, you can't go back to sleep and insomnia takes over, and you are in the night watches. You may not believe this, but um, some years ago, and this has been a while back, Jim Malden said to me, you know the other night I couldn't sleep, and I almost called you to come over and preach to me. <laughs> now you wish you had said that, right? But you know what I told him? I told him he could listen to the tape. <laughs> I don't know that it worked, but I'd recommend that to you if you can't sleep. So night watches takes on a different meaning, especially as you get older, and the night watches become a very serious thing. You know, when the scriptures speak of night, as they do quite often, sometimes it's used in a metaphorical sense or a figurative sense for the simple reason that the night brings out the worst in people. The literal night has the power to bring out the worst in us. I'll explore some of the ways in which that might happen a little bit later, but for that reason, it seems to me, the, the inspired writers, the Lord himself, referred to the night in a metaphorical way to teach a point. He did so, for example, in John chapter 3. If you'd like to open your Bible, just follow me here with a couple of passages that I think are pretty instructive about this. In John 3, and I begin with verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen. 
that they have been done in God. So you understand what the Lord is talking about there. Truth has come into the world. That's Him. Light. People don't like it. People will do everything in the world to avoid it. Because they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be known for who they are. They'll hide it. So thus, the darkness, the night, you see, used in a metaphorical sense. And <clears throat> he did so again in, um, in John chapter 12, just a few chapters over here, in 12th chapter. And here's an interesting statement in verse 35. Jesus said to his disciples, you know, a little longer, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. And he who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. Literally speaking, that's true. That's why I like a good flashlight with lots of lumens. So you'll know where you're going. Figuratively speaking, that's true too. Because if you walk in darkness, you don't know where you're going. And you don't know what's ahead of you. You don't know what you're in for. Somebody who gets involved in pornography doesn't know what's ahead of them. Somebody who drinks that alcohol, pops that pill, or sniffs that powder doesn't know what's ahead of them. There's a world of darkness there. They think they know, but they don't. And they don't see what's coming because they're living in darkness. That's the lesson, and that's the metaphor that stands out. In truth and in reality, the trial of Jesus, the betrayal of Jesus, the denial of Jesus, the scattering of all the disciples happened at night. All of it occurred in the nighttime hours. And Jesus said on, in, in this passage that we were just looking at in John 12, he who walks in darkness does not know what he's doing. Peter didn't know what he was doing when he denied the Lord in the night. Judas didn't know what he was doing when he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and did not know that within a short time he would die at his own hand. He doesn't know what the darkness holds. The other disciples that just ran, they didn't see what was coming. But Jesus said, you smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And that's what happened. So in a literal sense, you know, darkness does things to us. Brings out the worst in us. We struggle with it, especially as we get older. You work all day, you get home at night, and your mind works all night. It will not let you go. We have our limitations that are associated with the night. There are some of us, once the sun goes down, we don't get out. Why? Because we can't see well at night. The headlights on the road play tricks with your eyes, make it difficult for you. That's why our attendance, one of the reasons why our attendance on Sunday nights is down somewhat. There are other reasons, I know. But one of the reasons is when the sun sets earlier, people don't get out. So that's, that's life. I mean, what can you do about that? But the darkness does things, literal darkness, not just figurative, Literal. So when I look at passages like Lamentations 2, 18 and 19, and the night watches, 
And Jeremiah is referring to something that was very real to those people. Well, it's very real to us too because the literal night, darkness, does things to us. Now, I want to ask, there are two things that I want to do with this lesson this morning. Two things. And the first one is to ask, ask you the question, why are the night watches so difficult for us? What is it about the night that brings out the worst in people very often? I don't, I don't mean always, but sometimes, often it does. So what is it about the night watches that makes things so difficult for us? Well, there's obviously the reduced visibility. There's the reduced accountability. People don't see you. They don't know what you're doing. You're not observed as much at night as you are in the day. People know where you are and what you're doing and what's going on, whatever. But in the night, you know, there's that reduced factor that uh, people don't have their eye on you quite so much. And again, we get back to the trials of Jesus. That's why the trials of Jesus occurred at night. Against the law, against the teaching of the Mishnah. Because according to the Mishnah, the Jewish law, trials were not to occur before the morning sacrifice. In other words, you don't hold court at night. But that's what they did. They arrested Jesus at night. They tried him at night. They executed him the next morning. All of this taking place in the nighttime hours. Why? Because of reduced visibility, accountability. They could get by with it. And so they did it. So in the nighttime hours with Jesus, there was one betrayal. There was one denial. There was a trial that should never have taken place in the dark. <clears throat> And there was the loss of every single one of those disciples that scattered. In the nighttime hours, <clears throat> things happen that ought not happen. And then, you know, you have your day job and there are nighttime places that open up that the world loves and hopefully the saints hate and will avoid and never go to. Because at the night, the nightclubs open, the strip places open, the bars open, and they flourish. You say, well, I don't relate to that. I, I don't do any of that. Good. I hope not. But there are a lot of people that do. And if they've quit that kind of life, good for them. But maybe they struggle with it a little bit. They drive by a certain place and they look at it and hmm, okay, I remember that. That was kind of fun. No, you don't do that. Because the night, the literal night, is an opportunity <clears throat> to indulge in the lust of the flesh and that's what people do. That's what the world does. They do it in the daytime too. But in the night... You see, there's that special attraction, something different about it. So in the night, <clears throat> our minds work on us, too. You know, I, <clears throat> I understand how it is. Uh, you wake up, you can't go back to sleep. And you start thinking. And you just, it just won't let you go. And <clears throat> you're thinking about how things were for the day and a lot of it all good sometimes. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very negative stuff. And you let it work on you and it won't let you go. Night times can be that way. I'm not just imagining that. The psalmist, for example, in Psalm 30, verse 5, the latter part of the psalm, he says, weeping may endure for a night, 
but joy comes in the morning. In other words, you may, you may, you may worry and thrash and cry and whatever all through the night. And it's a long night. But joy comes in the morning. Sun comes up, you've got to go to work. So the night does things to us, doesn't it? Literally speaking. Won't let your mind quit working. And then there's fatigue, of course, takes over, you know. Fatigue does take over. And it's interesting that, that Peyton led a song regarding Gethsemane because that, this thought takes me to that point of Gethsemane in Matthew 26 when Jesus was with his disciples. And he said, now I want you to wait right here because I'm going to go over yonder and I'm going to pray and I want you to wait for me. I'll be right back. And guess what happened? They went to sleep on him. It was night. They went to sleep on him. He came back. He said, what in the world? You couldn't wait for me to one hour? He said, now I'm going back. I'm going to do this a second time. I want you to wait on me. He went back. They went to sleep again. Back to sleep. He did it a third time. In Matthew 26, 38 through 40, and then on beyond that. But he did it a third time, and he said, okay, you've had a nice nap. The betrayers are coming as we speak. Here they come to take me. All right, fatigue takes over. You're tired. You've worked all day. Your body has shut down. You're tired. So you don't want to come to Wednesday night Bible class. You're tired. So fatigue will take over our best intentions. And sometimes it will win. And some will come here fatigued or whatever and they'll fight it with all they've got. But they're, they're here. But fatigue does take over. That's the way the Lord made us. And then... You know, with regard to the night, you got to keep in mind and don't ever forget, the devil never sleeps. He never does. First Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, Peter said, because the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. He didn't stop. So, <clears throat> he will never let go of you. All right. You think that don't happen. I can control it. Yeah, it will happen too. The devil never sleeps. All right. That's why the night watches are so difficult. Now, what can we do about it? That's the second thing I want to do with this lesson. How can we deal with the night watches? With things like this going on all the time. And we deal with it because we're human. So how, how can we handle the night watches, you see, with struggles like this? Well, let me suggest a few things. And these are very simple. And you can take them to heart. One thing is, <clears throat> watch your friends. Choose your friends carefully. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul said that evil companionships corrupt good morals. But I want you to notice what he says ahead of that. Just ahead of that, he wrote, Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. In other words, pick your friends wisely because they will get you into trouble if you're not careful. And don't play games. Don't say, oh, that, that, don't, that won't happen to me. That's why Paul said, be not deceived. Because evil companionships will mess you up. I know a preacher who, um, who told of an <clears throat> older member of the congregation where he was working. Came to him one day and said, uh, you know, my daughter is different nowadays. She's very distant. She doesn't talk to me anymore. 
And I wonder if you could help me figure out what's going on with her. So he had the preacher come over, and they had access to her computer somehow or another. And they found out that she had become friends with uh, a bad group of people, and they were planning to kill her father, and she was in on it. She was going to be away to some event one evening, and, and they were supposed to break into the house, tie him up in a chair, and beat him to death. And that was the plan, you see. Well, she was a member of the Lord's body, of all things. So, choose your friends carefully. They will get you into trouble. All right? <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> guard your heart. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. Your heart will take you all kinds of places that you ought not go. Well, what does it look like to guard your heart? <clears throat> well, I hope it looks like your sanctification. In 1 Thessalonians 5 or 4 and verse 3, you know, sanctified, set apart. That's what a saint is. A Christian is that. And sexual immorality is not part of you. So, to guard your heart, what does that look like? It, it looks like what you might read. It looks like the movies you may go to. It looks like what you're doing on your phone at night. That's what it looks like. Guard your heart in the night and in the day. And here's something else to contemplate. And that is remember God's presence. We don't talk enough about the presence of God. We think God is a gray-haired grandfather setting off somewhere in the distance watching. We don't talk about the presence of God. That He is with us, He's present, and He's our constant companion at, in the day and in the night. Okay? And that's why I selected Psalm 63 for the reading which Daniel did earlier. In verses 6 and 7, here it is. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you've been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. So, <clears throat> the presence of God. When you can't go to sleep, don't call me. Pick up your Bible, read it. Study the Scriptures, read a good book that's Bible related. Fill your mind with good things. You read, you naturally kind of drift off a little bit. That's what you need. You go back to sleep. But there's God's presence here. We have to think on that. You know, God is awake and the night watches. He's always awake. And when, when you can't sleep, and just like the psalmist reflects here, I remember you on my bed. I meditate you in the night watches. That might include prayer. Pray. You don't have to save all your prayers for just Sunday. Pray. And it's interesting that uh, the Lord on one occasion in, uh, in one of his parables cast that parable in a midnight scene. In Luke chapter 11, in verse 5, he asked this question, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight And say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him within and say, don't bother me. The door is shut, my children are in bed, I, I can't get up and give to you. 
But I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus is teaching persistence in prayer. You remain persistent in prayer. God will listen to you. Pray at night if you have to, but pray. And then in the next breath, the Lord says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Well, that's persistence in prayer. But interestingly enough, Jesus used that same analogy in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 with regard to seeking the kingdom. And he said, seek and you'll find. Ask, it'll be given to you. Knock and it'll be open to you. If you seek the kingdom, you knock on the door of the kingdom. You, you ask, it'll open up to you. That's in a different setting. That's a different thought. But the same idea. Is that what you're doing? Are you seeking? Are you asking? Are you knocking? The door is open. Peter opened that door on the day of Pentecost to the Jews, later to the Gentiles, now to all. And Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Will you open? Will you respond to Him? By hearing, believing, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and to be immersed in Him for the remission of sins while we stand and sing to encourage Him.